Hello everyone, welcome to another installment of the Word for the Moment video blog. I just want to say once again how much we have appreciated the great feedback we've been getting from you on the last few blogs we've done. The one on the last days has gotten a lot of uh, circulation and great comments. Another Exodus has uh, certainly been circulated a lot and wonderful comments from people all over the world, literally. I appreciate that. I did one just before that on the dominion of God. And, and uh, <clears throat> my first intention was to continue in that vein today, but instead I feel like that I'm to take a, a blog and honor someone that has gone home to be with the Lord. Uh, a dear friend by the name of Neville Johnson. <clears throat> by now I'm sure most people have heard the news that Neville passed away on September the 1st. So I just thought I would take this blog and <clears throat> not incorporate it with anything else that I'm doing, but just take 15, 20 minutes or so and tell a little bit of the history that I have had with Neville, some of the prophetic crossroads that he and I had together and maybe relate it to some extent of where we are now. <clears throat> I believe it is pertinent. I, be I believe it is relevant. None of these things happen in the kingdom by accident. And, uh, you know, Neville passed away September the 1st. And it was kind of interesting. Two days before I received notice, or I saw the notice of his passing away on September the 2nd. And, uh, you know, Amy and I saw it, and I, my first comment was, wow, I'm, I'm shocked. And she said, you shouldn't be. And just two days earlier, she and I were sitting on the couch. And we were just looking at some YouTube stuff, you know, and <clears throat> one of our friends in Canada had written and just encouraged us to listen to some of Neville's stuff, uh, you know, because he was saying the same things we were. And so we were just talking about that a minute, and I just began to, you know, mention a little bit about Neville. And, and she said I kind of zoned out for a couple of minutes, just kind of went somewhere else for maybe a minute or two, and then I just kind of blurted out someone's about to go home and uh, <clears throat> then just kept going. But I got to be honest, in my mind, <clears throat> I did not connect that to Neville. I, I'm thinking Neville's going to live till the Lord returns. <laughs> so even though we were talking about Neville, I zoned out for a couple of minutes and then said someone's about to go home. I honestly did not even remotely connect that to Neville. I didn't. And so two days later, which was the 2nd of September, we saw the notice of his passing, and I said, I, I'm shocked at that. She said, well, you shouldn't be. The Lord tried to tell you, and I guess I just wouldn't hear it. I just wasn't willing to hear it. But as soon as I did just acknowledge that, as soon as I you know, connected that in my mind, Neville has passed away, I heard the scripture that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, John 12, 24, which says, unless a grain of wheat... Uh, perishes, it abides alone. But if it perishes, it brings forth much fruit, fruit like the original seed. <clears throat> and I felt like the Lord said to me at that moment that I didn't have a vision, I didn't have a dream, I didn't have an angelic visitation, just an internal witness that, you know, <clears throat> if maybe the Lord was trying to tell me a day or so before, then maybe this is also true that He went as seed for the message that he preached. And so I'm going to just talk for a few minutes about what I believe that means. What does it mean? What was his message? What was the heart of his message? <clears throat> I remember back in 2015, I was spending just hours and hours a day with the Lord. And the day before John Paul Jackson uh, passed away, uh, the Lord came into my room just in that presence. And I heard this internal voice began to talk to me about the Stephen and the Paul paradigm, <clears throat> where there was this uncon undeniable link between the death of Stephen and the reaping of Paul. I've taught on it many times. I'm sure most of you that have watched me remember it, where I had a vision of that. I saw the stoning of Stephen, and I, I saw the Lord as Stephen was about to die. I saw the Lord stand up in heaven and point his finger at the devil and said, that one is going to cost you. And I saw this undeniable 
spiritual transaction that took place where the devil took one of God's men, so God took one of his, the Apostle Paul. But he was never the devil's to begin with, but he was an instrument of the devil. Paul said he was an apostle from his mother's womb. He was born an apostle and was an apostle even when he was persecuting the church. He just had not yet had the revelation of it. He was ordained an apostle. And then the revelation came to him and no longer was he the great persecutor of the church. He became its greatest advocate. And so I felt like that is a truth. That is a relevant truth. And in the same way, I feel like with, with the passing of Neville, that there is a spiritual dynamic. Something is going to occur in the realm of the Spirit. Certainly things have changed and shifted since John Paul went in. And I was the same way with John Paul. I'm thinking, John Paul, 64 years old, God's going to heal him. He's going to raise him up. I, I did not anticipate, even though John Paul had had some sickness, that he was about to die. Same is true with Neville. But I met Neville, I'll never forget when I met Neville. It was uh, September the 10th, 2001. <laughs> and most of you remember what happened on September the 11th, 2001. I had flown to Vancouver, British Columbia to do a series, of about a week long set of meetings with Neville and Sadhu. And uh, <clears throat> I think I flew in late in the day on the 9th of the following day, which would have been the 10th of September. We began the meetings, and that's when I first met Neville, our first introduction to one another. I had uh, known Sadhu, had met him a little bit before that. And, uh, you know, the following morning, the morning of September the 11th, 2001, we all turn on the news to see the, the tragic news of the towers. And Neville came across the hall and came into my hotel room and we sat there on the bed talking to one another when the towers literally fell. We were sitting on the bed, I'll never forget, literally when the first tower collapsed. So I'll never forget when we met. <clears throat> Had something interesting happen that week. We went ahead and finished out the conference in Vancouver and obviously because of what had transpired with 911, all outside Air traffic had been shut down. There were all the flights that we would have had to go back into the States had been canceled. And so therefore we had to spend an extra day or two in Vancouver. And so on this extra day, after the conference was over, we were in Vancouver <clears throat> and had gone to dinner. And uh, I want to share a little something that might stretch a few people, but you know, this is, a, this is what happened. I'll tell you when I do what I believe about it. But we're sitting there, you know, and <clears throat> I had I had done some some research, if you if you will, in the Pyramid of Giza years earlier, back in the 90s. The Lord spoke to me and said, "What came illegally in the days of Noah will come legally through the sons of the kingdom." That was the, heard that audible voice say that one morning, the moment my eyes opened. What came illegally in the days of Noah will come legally by the sons of the kingdom. So I began to dig into that back in the 90s. And I discovered, you know, the book of Enoch and some of what that book teaches us, even though it's not scripture, it gives us a pretty good grasp of the spiritual conditions that existed in the days of Noah and how the angels that fell brought information and knowledge to the earth illegally, so forth. And um, <clears throat> I had actually heard Brother Branham talk about the Pyramid of Giza and uh, how Enoch had built the Pyramid of Giza. Now, you know, somebody might say, what? That's the first time you heard that. The Pyramid of Giza is a separate item than the other pyramids in Egypt. I believe it is the Isaiah 1919 Memorial. I believe there's much more to it. I listened to a teaching by Chuck Missler, who's now in heaven also. He has about a two hour teaching he was, he was a brilliant engineer, and so he understood it. He understood the construction and the, the astronomical precision of the location of the pyramid, the contour of the pyramid, the, just every, all these various details on the external and internal parts of the Pyramid of Giza. Way above my ability to really fully comprehend, but certainly to be able to teach. But Chuck Missler has the best teaching I've ever heard anyone wants to get it. His conclusion was whoever built the Pyramid of Giza 
had supernatural information. He kind of concluded he thought it was Seth. Well, you know, I don't. I believe it was Enoch. William Branham had a revelation that it was Enoch. I'm just laying that foundation to tell you my story with, with, um, with Neville. And the Lord began to teach me back then how they had access to, to knowledge that we're going to bring in the last days, one of which had to do with sound and light. How did they cut those stones with such precision? They harnessed the power of light. How did they move you know, two and three ton stones and move them up on the building. And people have imagined they built all kind of harnesses. And, and my revelation was they had, that they had harnessed the power of sound. Vibrations that made the, the stones almost levitate, if you will, and they pushed them into play. That's, that's my revelation. <laughs> if a person doesn't want to believe that, that's okay. Don't write me about it. You know, um, it's not mandatory for salvation. It was just something the Lord was teaching me back then when He was teaching me about how the sons of the kingdom will bring in extraordinary knowledge. Part of what Daniel prophesied over in Daniel 12. Now, back to Neville. And so we're sitting at dinner on <clears throat> this extra day while we tried to figure out how to get back into the States. And uh, Neville is sitting straight across from me at the table. <clears throat> and we're just having small talk, just casual conversation, and all of a sudden, out of my mouth, I said, well, tell me, Neville, who built the Pyramid of Giza? And he kind of fell back in his chair, you know, and he looked at me kind of funny. You gotta realize we just have known each other a couple of days now, and we'd only just done meetings, you know, so it was not like we had had a lot of conversation about things like that. So I, he leaned back in his chair, and he looked at me kind of funny. He says, well, who do you think built the Pyramid of Giza? I said, Enoch built the Pyramid of Giza. Like, <laughs> you know, I was completely sure about it, which is what I believe. And he said, oh my goodness. He just was beside himself. He said, my wife made me promise not to tell this to anybody. But he said, I just had an experience where the Lord came to me and began to unfold a panorama in front of my eyes. He said, I watched in a vision as Enoch and 100 of his spiritual sons built the Pyramid of Giza. And I just thought that was a wonderful introduction to a, to a friendship that kind of centered around that dimension of the supernatural. If a person doesn't want to believe that, that's no problem. It's what I believe. I believe someone had supernatural information. They built that as a memorial by the instruction of God. There's so many things. You might say, well, that's pyramidology. No, the devil steals everything God ever does. He tries to emulate it tries to counterfeit it and so forth. I'm completely confident saying the pyramid, that one pyramid was God ordained and God orchestrated and God engineered. Now, moving on. So that kind of began our friendship. <clears throat> that was all the way back in 2001. At about the same time, we started doing some meetings in Lancaster, California with Pastor Joe Sweet, who's been a good friend for a long time. And uh, Joe hosted us. He and I had a brief conversation. We think four years in a row. Could have been more that we did meetings, he and Sadhu and I. And so I just had this wonderful relationship with Neville. I believe Neville was a man of God. I believe he, he walked with God in an extraordinary way. You know, I said at the beginning of the blog that I felt like, you know, he might have gone as seed, a seed for, you know, the, ultimately the Lord is the seed. I mean, you know, John 12 is the Lord speaking of Himself, that He was a seed. He was the Son of God. But if He were to perish and go into the ground, the, the concept of reproduction was that then out of that will come a group of people, multiplied grains of wheat like the original seed. I've taught on it often, where the Lord goes into the ground 2,000 years ago as a seed planted. And we had a first fruits introduction of that in the early church. But then we've had 2,000 years of church history as this, the life of that seed has, has extended through the seven church ages throughout 2,000 years of church history. And even while the church was in the Babylonian system, inside of that was a life that, that was gonna eventually at the end of the age you know, produce great fruit. And so as the, the last of the age is that they begin to put forth the buds and they begin to, 
the, the shuck of the wheat and on the inside of that are the seeds. And I believe the very end of the age is a community, a company of people, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people moving and mature, or even hundreds of, I don't have any idea of the numbers, but they will be just like the original seed that went into the earth 2,000 years ago and fulfill uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13, where we see the fullness of the stature of Christ manifested in the mature man. And so I believe Neville was a part of that principle, the principle that God you know, allowed that we see with Stephen, the principle that the death of Stephen meant the reaping of Paul. And so with that, I believe the death of Neville will be the reaping of the reality of the message that Neville preached. And if I could sum everything up that Neville preached, he preached a lot of things, obviously. I, I haven't heard everything Neville preached, but I, we did enough meetings together that I... I know that, and we communicated quite a bit by Skype or telephone or by email. And so I, but the heart of his message was, I believe, was to raise up a company of people at the end times who walked with God like Enoch did. That's what I, I mean, that sums it up. A group of people that have access to the unseen realm, which is what we have been bringing for quite some time over the last few blocks. A body of people that have heard the Lord say, come up here and I will show you what will take place hereafter. A body of people that have, have lived the reality of Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 7, where they have been given free access to the presence of God. A group of people that have entered into the very heart of God to access the secrets of God and the mysteries of God, things that are hidden in Christ according to Colossians chapter 2. That, that was the heart of his message to walk in great realms of intimacy and fellowship with God, manifesting the revelation of Jesus Christ on planet Earth. That's what, that's what he preached. The sum total of most everything that I know of. He had some good practical teachings about the prophetic and other things. But the heart of what I know, at least my exposure to Neville was, and my communications with him, was a body of people that genuinely walked with God like Enoch did. And the deal is, that's going to happen. <laughs> It's going to happen. And so while I was very sad about the passing of Noah, still am. I'm still sad about it. But on the other hand, there is a positive spiritual dynamic. You know, he's among the cloud of witnesses now. Uh, he's pretty happy. <laughs> you know, he's in a good place. And so we don't weep for him. We weep for ourselves because who's going to fill that void? There weren't a lot of people like Neville. I don't know of anyone. I don't know of anyone of all the other ministers, at least, that I've ministered with in the past, other than my wife, that believes the message the way the, that I do the way I believe it. Neville did. And so, you know, there is a loss there. There is a void, and I believe God's going to fill the void. And before this thing gets too long, I want to share one other thing that happened with us, and I'll close with this. Back in 2008, Neville and Sadu and I did a meeting in J Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives. Sadhu Salvaraj hosted the meeting in a tent on the Mount of Olives. Just prior to that, I had had an experience. The night of the experience, I felt troubled, deeply troubled, and um, couldn't sleep. And so I went into the den area. I prayed until I just felt like I didn't have anything else to pray. Go into my bedroom, the moment my head hits the pillow, the moment my head hits the pillow, I sh what I feel like shoot out of my body. And I go down into what I call the bowels of hell. That was the words that I used when I shared it first on the School of the Spirit, which is, by the way, on our website. <clears throat> and I saw this evil-looking creature walking over to what I called a manhole. And most of you probably that watch this know like in the street systems of most cities, you have a manhole where they can access the underground pipes and different things, and it's covered by a lead cover. And we call that a manhole. So in this experience, I'm watching as this evil-looking creature walks over to what looked like a manhole and was beginning to open it. And I knew whatever was on the other side was horrendous, was horrible. And so I began to scream out, no, no, you know, don't let him do that. And just as I did, he took this manhole and he removed it. And when he did, this black billowing stuff just came pouring out. 
just this thick looking black horrible stuff came pouring out of the manhole just shooting straight up and I could see periodically the images of people I saw the image of Stalin then I saw the face of Hitler go up and other tyrants of history that, go, that went shooting up and and I was just overwhelmed and I thought I can't take this anymore I'm down in this dark dingy hellish place that I call the bowels of hell and I was overcome by what I was seeing and when I felt that feeling that sensation of being overcome I heard an audible voice speaking it and say oh by the way I forgot to tell the most of the another part so this black billowing stuff was coming out of hell that was demonic then I could see I was seeing a vision within the vision demons meeting in the bedrooms of people teaching them how to walk in realms of darkness they were having demonic visitations willingly desiring to understand realms of darkness that was when I was overwhelmed and I heard a voice say and the sons of light must respond in like fashion and when I heard that voice I looked straight up and these double doors opened up in heaven and angels came pouring out of heaven. It was as though they had been standing behind that door for eons of time, waiting for the moment that the doors burst open. It was as if they had been prepared by God from eternity past. Whenever they were created, they were waiting for a specific moment in human history when they would be released to go down to planet Earth. And I knew that they were related to the end of the age, that their function their responsibility, what they carried was essential for the end of the age. Then I watched them begin to manifest themselves in the bedrooms of the saints of God, beginning to teach them how to walk in realms of glory. It was an, it was an amazing experience. That happened on a Friday, by the way. So that was the essence of it. There's so much more to it than that. So I shared, uh, so I didn't tell anyone about that. On Monday morning, I sat on it through the weekend. On Monday morning, I just felt this urge, this sensation to write the vision down and send it to Neville, Neville Johnson. So I did that. Within 30 minutes of me sending, of course, he's in Australia, 18 hours ahead. But within 30 minutes of me sending it, he wrote right back, totally shocked. He said, I had that exact experience that morning, which would be Monday morning. And he said, in fact, there was a couple there from the States that I happen to know that were staying the weekend with him. And at breakfast that morning, he shared his experience with them verbatim, every detail, even the faces of the other, of the tyrants that I saw pouring up into, you know, up into the earth. <clears throat> the exact experience. Just as a side note, I feel like the oil spill of, of 2010, April 20th, Hitler's birthday. <laughs> When, when, when they said a man-made hole was breached in the, in the crust of the earth, which is exactly what it looked like when I had my experience. And when I looked on the news and saw this oil come pouring up out of the bowels, and that's what they said. They said this oil is coming up out of the bowels of the earth, the exact word I'd used. It was a man-made hole releasing oil into the gulf, and that black billowing stuff looked identical to what I had seen in my experience. What was it? A timepiece. It was a marker that the spiritual conflict between light and darkness has been taken to another level. I think we can look back over the last eight, nine years and confirm that's true. And it's going to escalate. Darkness is going to get darker and light's going to get more brilliant. And so we shared that experience together and on, on in, in 2008 on the Mount of Olives I began to share it through a message called messengers of his face and it was a very powerful thing that we began to prophesy and share and it was something that Neville and I communicated together and this has already gone a long time so here's my conclusion my conclusion is that that the passing of Neville is a is a marker in time I remember Back in 1947, Charles S. Price died March 8th, I believe it was, 1947. Four days later, Smith Wigglesworth passes away. And by 1948, 
the whole country was in a massive revival called the Latter Rain or the Voice of Healing Revival. I'm praying something like that happens for us. We have Bob Jones going home, you know, Valentine's Day 2014, John Paul 2015, and Paul Kane goes home. Other, other people have gone on. T.L. Osborne, I think, went home in 2013, if I remember right. Uh, different ones have, have gone, to, gone home, gone into glory, whatever the word is we want to use. Maybe it's marking a time frame that a new breed is about to arise. Something fresh is about to be released on the earth that will transform current understanding of Christianity. I, I just want to say that I trusted Neville. One of the three or four most powerful prophetic words I've ever received from anyone including Bob Jones and other major prophets, came from Neville. And I am praying, Lord, let that word be true. Let it be now. Let it be now. Let this be the hour. Let this be the moment. Delay no longer. That's my prayer. Revelation chapter 10, delay no longer. And, you know, these people have laid a foundation. You know, they have, they have poured themselves into a generation of people. I I kind of felt like Neville might live till the Lord returns. He was in his late 70s, but you know, what's, is that hard for God? He quickens our mortal body. That's what it says in Romans 8, 11. Age means nothing to him. He can quicken us and cause us to be stronger at 100 than we were at 40. Look what he did to Moses under an old covenant. So I, I don't have any concern about that when it comes to age issues. But for whatever reason, you know, the Lord allowed Neville to be taken home. And uh, we have to deal with it. We have to begin to ask the Lord for the wisdom. What does that mean? What does it mean for us now? I know what it means for him. He's in glory. He's probably already working pretty hard. He's probably might be, might be right here right now among the cloud of witnesses as we begin to talk and honor God and honor the people that served God. It brings that realm and that dimension. Maybe even now as I'm sharing it with you, something stirring in your in your room or in your car or wherever you happen to be while you're watching this because it's going to bring a spiritual dynamic. It's going to bring the unseen realm, evidence of the unseen realm. So Lord, I pray. I pray that now would be the time, that this would be the day of salvation. This would be the hour that you say to a body of people, come up here, just as you did to the, to the apostle John. Come up here and I'll show you things that will take place hereafter. And we get an image, we get a visualization, we get a, an experiential concept of what it means to worship in the throne room. When the four living creatures and the 24 elders fall down on their faces, casting their crowns before the Lord, declaring worthy is the Lamb to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and according to your will, they existed and were created. That's my desire. I want to see that. And I know Neville gave his life for a body of people to have access to that realm and that dimension to see those things firsthand and come back with real authority and begin to prophesy the reality of the kingdom age. Release that to your people, Lord. I ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, amen.